whether it's, uh, it's grain, whether it's, uh, it's oil, whether it's gas, we're looking at all those components very, very carefully. Some of them are on the way up and they will have consequences on, on prices. We had a good scenario analysis produced by staff about China and the role that China growth or deceleration of growth would have on, on our own uh, GDP and our inflation. That combined with the price of oil is obviously something that we need to be attentive to. ECB President Christine Lagarde highlighting the energy sector, which is quickly becoming the culprit for absolutely everything this week. US retail sales and producer prices coming in hotter than expected, fueled by higher gasoline prices. Auto workers going on strike, the union nervous about President Biden's robust EV transition, eliminating jobs, and a number of US airlines slashing their outlook, all placing the blame on rising fuel costs. All of this, no surprise to Jim Bianco, who wrote a few weeks ago, quote, crude oil and gasoline prices are about to take centre stage. They take centre stage right now. Jim Bianco joined us from Bianco Research alongside Mohamed Alarian here in New York. Jim, you said it. Here we are, $94 crude. What does it change? I think it changes a lot because while we look at the reduction in supply and we look at the voluntary cuts of OPEC to blame that for the higher prices, Let's look over at the demand side, and demand is booming. And demand is booming in oil, and we've got, at the same time, very weak growth in China. So we're seeing probably a transition from transit uh, uh, commuting to auto commuting, and it's also maybe an underlying sign that there's going to be no soft landing or hard landing in the economy, maybe a no landing, because of this continued strength. As long as we have this cocktail of strong growth, our strong demand, and we have voluntary cutbacks, I think the price of oil is going to keep going up, the price of gasoline is going to keep going up. And the final thing is, I think we're a ways away from demand destruction. We're at $3.87 a gallon nationally in the U.S. I don't think it's $4 that's going to start demand destruction. I think it's much, much higher, and that will first falter, foster into much higher inflation before we start talking about demand destruction. Hey, Jim, this is really important. This goes back to one of my favorite questions at the moment. Do you view this then as a reflection of the extension of the cycle and not a recipe to end it? Yes, I do view it as an extension of the cycle. I've always been of the opinion that we're in a post-pandemic economy, big fancy word for meaning that that shutdown restart of the economy in 2020 was the most important economic event of our lifetime. When we rebooted the economy, it did not come back the same. That doesn't mean dystopian or worse. It means different. And we've got this chronic shortage glut, shortage glut cycle as we try to figure out what this post-pandemic economy means. And this is more of the same, whether it's the China slowdown, it's the gasoline, or it's even the strike with the UAW and the Hollywood strike and nearly the strike with the freight trains in the West Coast ports and all of a sudden the movement and labor that we're seeing. It's all part of that same mosaic that the economy is fundamentally changing changed since 2020. Not worse, changed, and we still haven't quite figured out what that is. Jim, you put forward two hypotheses. One is that oil and gas prices are going higher, and two is that demand destruction will take time, which raises the th a very important question. What's your feeling about the pass-through? How much th of this is going to spill over into a wider price impact? I think it's going to spill over into a wider impact. I think that the attitudes have changed. I wouldn't quite go as far to say that, you know, inflation expectations are unanchored, but let's say they're loosening as we move forward. I'll remind us back in 2021 when Procter & Gamble raised prices. They announced it in March. They said it would be take a place in September. And they said that in the interim, they'd write a white paper to explain why they were raising prices. That's how epic it was to raise prices two years ago. Today, we just raised prices. And so we've un we've loosened the anchor a little bit. And I think if oil prices keep coming up with that loosening anchor, we're going to see this getting passed through, not just at the pump, but in transportation costs, delivery costs, input costs. It's going to be problematic, I think, up and down the line. So if you are sitting at the Federal Reserve and you agree with your three hypotheses, oil going higher, no demand destruction, and it will be passed on, what would you do? 
Well, I've been a bit more hawkish than the consensus. I think that they're going to raise rates in November, and I don't think that that's going to be the last rate hike. Now, the next one might not come until 24, but even if there isn't another rate hike, I think the idea that there will be multiple rate cuts in 2024 is premature. The only reason the Fed would cut rates in 24, I think, is if we saw a recession, a full-blown out hard landing recession, and they responded to it. Short of that, I'm in the higher for longer camp, and I'm not even sure that one more rate hike is really done. And that's the way I'd be looking at it. So, Jim, you've got to make a bond market call off the back of that analysis. We've got a 10-year in the 430s, a 30-year around 440, a two-year still in and around 5% right now, up two basis points on the day. What's the bond market call? I think the yields are going to continue to head higher. I don't think that the cycle is over. Well, let me back up and say that yields bottomed in August of 2020. I think that ended the 40-year bull market in bonds. We're in a multi-year bear market in bonds. We're in year four. August of 23 started year four of it. We're only three basis points or four basis points in the 10-year from another 16-year high. And I think that those rates were going to continue higher. Now, there will be fits and starts. There will be rallies. There was a huge rally in the bond market off of this. Silicon Valley bank failures in March, but then we turned around and completely reversed that uh, by the end of the summer. And so I do think that irregularly rates are going to go higher. I think irregularly that the yield curve is going to at least stay at its current space or maybe even flatten or get more inverted because ultimately I don't think the Fed is done with one more rate hike. So I'd have a very defensive position in the bond market right now when it regarding rates. Jim, if that's the call and if you're right, Where's the rest of the world? Where's Europe? Where's China? Well, I think that there's a little bit of a, a split between China and the rest of the world. If I'm right, and the problem is that we've got sticky inflation and a post-pandemic economy, that's global. And that's going to impact everybody else. And we're seeing that, whether you're talking about Japan or Europe, higher inflation across the board everywhere. We're seeing higher rates across the board everywhere. And I think we're going to continue to see those rates moving higher. China's a little different story. They're on a different cycle. They're decelerating. They're going down in terms of their economy. And I might add, it's really surprising that after they opened from zero COVID at the beginning of the year, their economy just kind of was a dull thud on the floor in terms of its pickup. So that might be something different. And because they're in a different cycle, I don't think that the spillover effects from China, there will be some, won't be nearly as great as people fear. So I think globally, we're going to continue to see higher rates as well in wow. a regular pattern, but they're going to keep going up. Hey, Jim, fascinating call. Jim Bianco there of Bianco Research. The last 24 hours has been so busy.